This morning we're going to be reading this whole chapter right here, John chapter 17. And so we're just going to go ahead. I just chose to read out of the ESV version, but I, I think most of my slides are made off of the King James. So we'll just see. There's some little minor differences, but let's just go ahead and read this whole chapter. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me, I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. I just want you to see that part right there, verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them, even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Father, we just want to thank you this morning and give you glory and honor. We want to praise you and and thank you for your word, O oh Lord God. I pray, Lord, that you would give us revelation and understanding. I pray that you would give us wisdom. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be with us and that you would help us to understand what you desire to be spoken this morning, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you would help us, Lord, to live the lives that you've called us to live, Lord, we cannot do it without you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I titled this morning's message, Jesus Prayed for You. Amen. You know, 
We talk a lot about the Lord's Prayer, and we learn how Jesus taught us to pray when he said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he gave us an example of how we are to pray, to understand that God the Father is hallowed. He's sanctified. He's altogether separate and holy in heaven. There's many gods that try to prevail on the earth, but there's none of them that are God. They're all just trying to steal God's glory, and they're trying to steal God's kingdom. And, and, and Jesus wanted you and I to know, hey, when you pray this way, when you pray, pray this way. But I wanted you to see this morning that Jesus prayed for you. Yeah. Amen. I want you to know that Jesus prayed for you and Jesus prayed for me before he went to the Father. He, he was praying to the Father and he was saying, I have accomplished the work. There's just one more thing left to do. There's just one more thing left to do, but I have come to do what it was that you called me to do. And so now I'm going to pray for these that you have given me. And he said, I'm not praying for them alone. I'm praying for them also that will believe based upon their work. What he was talking about was the disciples. See, there were going to be people through the ages, people like you that are sitting in this church this morning, that were going to believe based on the testimony of the original disciples. One of the beautiful things that I learned whenever I first studied the Gospel of John, and Robert and I were teaching Bible study a long time ago, one of the things that, that was pointed out to me, even in chapter 1 and then in going into chapter 2 of the Gospel of John, is that the Bible says that there were two disciples of John. John said on the day after, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The Bible says that the two disciples that were John's disciples left John and they connected themselves to Jesus. Church tradition would tell us that that was John the Beloved that wrote the Gospel of John and also Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. The Bible says that immediately Andrew went and found his brother Peter and he says, we found him. We found the Messiah. We found the one that we've been waiting for, the one that was told to us through the prophets in the Old Testament that he would come one day. We have found him. And then guess what? Peter and Andrew, they were from Galilee. They went to the fishing town of Galilee and there they found Philip. And the next thing you know, they find Bartholomew under the fig tree. And one of the things that the Lord showed me is this is how my gospel goes forward. That yes, they're, they're, even in the midst of a world full of technology, they might broadcast it on a television, they might tell it on a radio, but for the most part, the way my gospel message goes forward is that my word and my truth changes someone on the inside, and now that changed person begins to tell others about my goodness Amen. and my glory, and it spread just like that, just the same way that it was way back when it still spread that way. Today, I want you to know that Jesus prayed for you because he didn't just pray for them, but he prayed for you who would learn of him through the testimony that they also gave. The first point I wanted to make is to make God known, because you see, really, if we just break this chapter down, I believe that what we begin to see is that that was the heart of Jesus in all of this. The heart of Jesus's prayer was that God would be made known. You know, I, I, don't, I don't need to just follow along every little slide perfectly. What I really want to do is I want to talk to you from my heart more than anything. And I want to tell you, I don't know if you're like me or not, but sometimes I'm just driving down the road and I get overwhelmed. I, I get overwhelmed because I realize the things that I understand about God today and I realize how little I understood about God back then. You understand? And how I also understand how much more I have to learn about God. But I do remember that when God entered into my life through my sister's change in her life and her introducing me to the Lord. And I don't know, if, as you live for God and you've tried to talk to people about the things of God, if you really stop and try to have a humble heart and a heart that cares about the Lord, what will happen is you won't. You may go through stages like I was going. I, I mean, I hope I'm not the only person like this. But the more I started learning about the Lord, I started getting self-righteous. I started thinking, man, I know how to wield the sword of the Lord. Maybe I'll cut you to shreds with this sword. It's so sharp. Leave you bleeding on the street. But then guess what will happen is, is that the Lord started to break my heart. Yes, Lord. He started to break my heart. And he started saying, son. 
it wasn't that long ago that you didn't know the first thing about me. If it wasn't for my grace and my mercy, you wouldn't know me. And, and, and when I begin to realize what God has done in revealing himself through the Son, and if you are like me and you've gone hopefully past that whole self, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm past up the self-righteous phase, but hopefully we're getting past it. To the point where our heart is broken for the law. And, and then you engage them in conversation and you realize, have you ever noticed how little the world knows about God? I'm just saying, like, I'm not saying that in a judgmental fashion. I'm just speaking the truth. Have you noticed how little the world out there really knows about God? It's really sad to think that that God, had, the Father, has gone through all of this and given Jesus for the whole purpose that the world would be able to know the existence of God and be able to have a relationship with God. And then sometimes I just think about this simple thought that had I would have never been able to know God had God not introduced Jesus upon this earth. Jesus is the express image of God. Without his image, without his words, without his actions, without it being chronicled in the word of God, I would know nothing of God. God has made himself known to Matt A. Bear through the word of God, through the spirit of God, that thank God somebody told me the good news about Jesus, hallelujah, and by his grace, because it wasn't sure enough, because I was good enough, but by his grace, I was willing to believe, and when I was willing to believe, God allowed his presence, his spirit, his life to enter in on the inside of me, and he made it possible that I would begin a journey of knowing God. I don't know if you've ever thought about it like that before. I don't even know if I explained it like I needed to. But I'm just telling you that I'm so glad that God has made a way for me to know him. Amen. What a miserable life. Even the apostle Paul said it. What a miserable existence if this is all there is. I don't care how, listen, as beautiful as the water is in Destin, just wait about three or four days and let the surf start churning because then there's going to be seaweed all over the doggone beach. And this world is fallen. This world is, is painful. This, this life is full of frustrating circumstances. If this is all there is, the best of this, it, Paul said it's pitiable if this is all there is. But I'm here to tell you that it's not all there is. There's a good God, amen. <laughs> and the whole purpose of this is to make God know. That's point number one. I wanted you to see that the words Jesus spoke. John 17, 1, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. The whole purpose in this is to make God known. Whenever you look at this word glory right here, there's a part to it. Like if you just read it, it's dox doxazo, it, to make glorious, to adorn with luster. Luster is like something that shines. Certainly God the Father did that in Jesus when he resurrected him from the dead. Amen. Certainly even on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bible says that he became white like fuller's soap, like, like, a, like a garment that had been washed with fuller soap. The only way that can be like a bleached garment. It was, he, was, he was radiating and shining. And certainly in the resurrection, God the Father did that. But look what, it, look what one of the main things of glory. And I found this, this part of the definition because this is the context. To cause the dignity and worth of some person or thing to become manifest and acknowledged. Jesus said for, for the Father to glorify him so that the Son may glorify the Father. If you'll remember, and you may not, but let me help you remember that when we read the chapter, Jesus also said that he was going to share his glory with you and I. There's this, Brother Larson used to call it the divine entanglement. He's in the Father, the Father's in him, the Son's in me, I'm in the Son, there's a divine entanglement. The glory of the Father is in the Son, the glory of the Son is within me, 
And through this beautiful plan that God has, he has made it in such a way that the glory of God can shine out of me as messed up as I am, as messed up as some of you are. The glory of God can still manifest itself through this thing called marred clay, through this that's why the clay needs to be moved out the way. That's why the flesh needs to be moved out the way. So that the Spirit of God can show the glory of God to a lost and a dying and a hurting world out there, folks. Listen, the world is in a world of hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus said, it's to make God known. He said, Father, the hour has now come. I've done what you called me to do. Now the hour is upon us. And now I'm asking you to glorify me so that I can bring glory to you as you have given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him and this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent this is life eternal that they might know you the only true God. I keep being brought back to this. That the only real purpose in this. Listen. <clears throat> I know I say this all the time. So you're probably getting tired of hearing it. But I got to tell you. That this is not the majority of the way of thinking. Even in the church of God. I'm not trying to act like we've arrived. In this little video of church. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I am trying to make a point. It ain't my words. It's Jesus' words. That the emphatic point to this vapor that James called, James the, the apostle called this a vapor of life. It's, it's here one minute and it's going to be gone the next. It's a temporary state of mind. It's a momentary existence. I know. I know that it seems like the world's crum crumbling around us sometimes. I get that. Whenever our loved ones, our children, wait till your young children grow up and become adult children. Hopefully, that it doesn't get worse and it only gets better for you. But guess what? Let me let you in on a little secret. Every corner that you turn, there's heartache, there's pain, there's negative circumstances. But I'm here to tell you that the word of the Lord says that this vapor of life, the meaning to life is, will you know God? How will you come to know God? And will you serve him? I can go walk off in Iberia General Medical Center over there where I work. I'll go to work tomorrow and I may have an opportunity to tell somebody. I done told them three or four times. The people that, that where the conversation have come up. I, and I'll just say it like that. I say this quite often. I'm convinced that my whole purpose here. Listen to me. And do they think I'm crazy? They probably do because these are the people that are claiming to be saved. I am convinced. Why do you keep talking about it? Because I'm convinced that my whole purpose on this earth is to make a decision on whether or not I will serve God. Amen. And that's your purpose on earth. This thing is either real or it's not, my friend. And if this story is real, then it's not about how much money you can make. It's not about what kind of property you can attain. It's not about what the next stock is going to be. And I'm all about making money. I'm all about living a life of excellence. I'm all about trying to be better and better myself. I'm all about being the best employee that the boss can have. And by the way, if you're an employee, you're supposed to listen to your boss and do what your boss wants you to do. As long as he's not telling you to do something opposite of the Lord. Yeah. I'm all about showing up to work all the time. And I'm all about giving 150% while I'm there. And I don't want them getting a bad name about my Jesus whenever I'm on the clock. They, they ain't paying me to play on my phone. No, they're paying me to produce. And if I'm over here voicing out of my mouth the name of Jesus, then my actions... I need to be, Lord, help me, because I need your help, Lord, to live my life in such a way that it doesn't drag you down. It doesn't drag your name to me. Amen? I'm convinced, church. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that I'm just not that, I'm not, what I'm not convinced about is that the majority of the church world believes the same. Preachers across America, across the world even, mostly in America, will tailor a message this morning. And they'll present to their congregation a message that convinces the congregation that it's about them. They'll tailor a message that's relevant for them. It's going to make them feel better about their situation and their circumstance. 
I'm here to tell you that we're here. To, I'm here to tailor a message this morning that brings glory to the Lord, that magnifies the name of Jesus, that notifies you and puts you on notification that this whole life that you're living, there's not gonna, it's not gonna make any sense. I still try to tell my daughters this that were raised in my own home. I tried to, baby, there's not gonna, there's not gonna be any meaning to life. There's not gonna, it's not gonna make any sense unless you give your heart to the Lord, unless you're willing to serve God and allow God to make himself known to you so that he can then make himself known to others through you. That's the simplistic version of it. And this is life eternal, that they might know you the only true God. See, so, so death eternal is to not know God. And, and you know, one of the things that I think about, because I don't know about you, but if you talk to enough people, they'll start to say, well, I don't understand how you can serve a God who's going to send people to hell. I mean, I've been dealing with that one for a long time. And I can remember one time. So I said, I said time out, boss, because <laughs> God, the God I serve ain't sending nobody to hell. What, what are you talking about? Yo, no, no, no. Time out, sir. The God that I serve isn't sending anyone to hell. The God I serve sent a lamb. He sent a lamb, sir. He sent his only begotten son to die naked on a cross for you, for me, for your friends in school, for the people that you work with, for all of these multiple people that are out here. Even in the city of Patterson, Louisiana, the policeman that stops me when I drive too fast. The doctor that I go see, the teacher that I sit in her classroom, all of these people, God wants them to know him. And he died for them. He sent his son to make himself known to the world. And the message has gone forth, Christian. The message has been going forth since the beginning of time when God the Father in the garden told the serpent, the seed of the woman will Crush your head. The message has been going forward. The problem is, is that people don't want to believe it. They can't believe it. Because sometimes, and I'm using myself as an example. I don't need to use you as an example. Because Lord knows he done, I done messed up enough that I can use myself as an example. Sometimes they don't want to believe it because I'm not a valid witness. I'm not saying that to beat nobody up. I'm just trying to say, sometimes they don't want to believe it because I'm not a valid witness. All I can say is cry out to the Lord, and that's my heart. Lord, make me a more valid witness. Lord, through your grace, through the Spirit of God, through the truth of your word, conform me on the inside. It cause my position to, I mean, my condition to line up to my position. Amen? Amen. My, my condition, my, my position is that I'm in Christ. My position is that I am completely free of sin. Now, Lord, I pray that you would do a work on the inside of me that my life would be a reflection of your love, of the change that you've done on the inside of me. The, the enemy is going to spend, none of this is in my notes, but I just got to tell you, the enemy is going to spend the rest of your life on this earth trying to convince you that you are unworthy. Right. Yeah, have, you, have you figured that out yet, Christian? And the sooner you come to the realization that what he's saying is the opposite of what the Father's saying... And the sooner you come to the realization that the reason that the father is saying the opposite of the devil isn't because you got it right all the time or I got it right all the time, but because Jesus got it right every time. And now the father clothes you in the son. And when he sees you, he doesn't see your failures and your faults. He sees Jesus, the darling of heaven. And based on that, God the father's like, he's pleased with you. Does that make sense? You know, I can remember one time when I was reading that. Whenever Jesus was baptized, the voice from heaven said, this is my son in him. I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit said, you see that? And I don't know how he talks to you, but it's what the Lord showed me. He said, I'm not pleased with you, man. I'm pleased with my son. And when you clothe yourself in my son, now I can be pleased. See, it's all about him. You can strive and you can work and you can scrub your hands clean. You can scrub your whole body and try to make yourself as clean as you want to. But the, what pleases me is that you chose my son. Amen. I made this whole thing about him. I made a way for you to come to me, to make myself known to you. 
And when you believe, and listen to me, Christian, by you being a, a certain portion of a minority, you got to understand, I don't care what the Gallup poll says. Every year is about the same. 85% of people call themselves Christians. I can tell you right now, that ain't true. Not the kind that the Bible's talking about. Oh, what, you think you've arrived? No, I know I haven't arrived. I'm trying to make a point. I know what the Word of God's saying. And listen, as we move forward in this message, we're going to see what the Lord is trying to say. Look, God's possession, not the world's. That's, that's point number two. God's possession, not the world's. Look at what Jesus said. I pray for them. He's talking about his disciples. I pray not for the world. I want you to see that. Jesus said, I'm not praying for the world. I pray for them. Yeah. Who's them? His disciples. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine. In other words, they're yours, and those that belong to me belong to you. And yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now, I don't want you to get confused. Well, I thought Jesus loved the world. I thought he died. He did. Look what he says here a few verses later. That they all may be one. Talking about disciples. Talking about those that would follow Christ. As you, Father, are in me. And I in you. That they also may be one in us. Why? Why do you want all that to happen, Jesus? Why do you want, why do you want to be in the Father, the Father in you, and then now you're in me and me and you? And Why do you want us to be all divinely entangled and so close with one another? That the world may believe that you have sinned. See, the more I'm in Christ, and the more Christ is in the Father, and the more I'm entangled with the love of God, the love of God starts to penetrate me, starts to permeate me, starts to change me. Starts to change my reactions. My brother this morning said, I'm noticing my reactions are changing. It's a beautiful thing when you tend to have a sassy attitude and the Lord starts changing. Yeah. Amen. I'm so grateful, look. And only the Lord can protect me because I don't, still ain't getting it right. So, I mean, you can, you can test me if you want. I might get sassy with you. <laughs> it's a good chance I will. But one of the things that I've learned that the Lord does, he loves me so much <laughs> that sometimes he won't even let me realize what happened until I drive away. <laughs> and look, I was pretty good back in the day. It was like giving a little zinger back, you know. Oh, you hit me and pop. I'm a good, pretty good little counter punch. Like but then I'm driving down the road and I'm like... Dude, they just did, they just uh, yeah. talked trash about me. And you know, and, and there's a split second that I don't want to flip the car around and say, you didn't get away with that. And the Lord's like, I'm protecting you, son. I'm protecting my name. The Lord's like, I'm protecting my name. You're over here talking about me. I want to change you on the inside. You ain't got to have the last word all the time. You don't always have to be right, Matt. I know it kills you sometimes because you feel like you know everything. But you don't always have to be right and you don't always have to have the last. Amen. That's a Amen. word for me. That's a word for Amen. Me. Amen. <laughs> he wasn't talking to you, he was talking to me. <laughs> Look, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which you have given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And whenever you allow me to change them, whenever they're changed on the inside, guess what? The world is going to know that I am real and that I am in you and that you have sent me because the world is going to see you in me, in them. Amen. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, I mean, we, look, we could preach 45 minutes just on that, could we not? Right. You know, this is one of the reasons why you and I should be able to realize that much of what is spoken behind many pulpits. And I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to, if you don't believe me, I always want to, don't want to come across the wrong way. I'm not trying to be sassy. I don't want people to go to another church. I'm so glad y'all showed up over here this morning because you could have went to any church. I want, I don't want to be mistaken when I say this from behind the pulpit. But I can tell you that the more you learn the word of God, and again, it's not to say that nobody else is preaching the truth. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what I am trying to say is this, is that when the truth goes forth and it starts to change the inside of you, there's going to be something that takes place, a separation between you and the world. And whenever you start to live your separated life in public, listen to me, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. 
You understand what I'm getting at? Like you can do it with a cocky attitude or you can do it with a humble spirit. But whether you do it with a cocky attitude, a cocky attitude is not going to get it done for the Lord. But if you do it with a humble spirit, can I tell you that the world is going to produce, it's going to produce like a, a, for a moment, a detesting life inside of the world for you. What, 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 are you, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that just taking a stand for the Lord. So let, let me give you an example. Alcohol. I'm going to use alcohol as an example just because it just popped in my head. You know, we could sit here and we could argue over whether or not they drank wine in the, in the, in the New Covenant, whether or not they drank. I don't have time for all of that. Let's just take where we live today. Let's take South Louisiana. And let's take the context of what alcohol means in South Louisiana. Do I have to convince you of that? Do I have to sit here and play games with your, with your head to play, let you play games with my head for you to try to convince me that alcohol doesn't have a certain context in South Louisiana? And that if someone sees you who profess Jesus one day with a beer in your hand tomorrow, that they're going to automatically think that it's okay to tear one on. Can I tell the truth? I think I'm telling the truth. Amen. But whenever you allow Jesus to live in you and the opportunity arises and somebody says, uh, hey, man, we're going after work to go get a beer. You want to come with? No, man, I I appreciate that, but I don't drink anymore. Well, why don't you drink anymore? I'm just telling you how I would say it. You say it however you feel like to say it. Because when I drink, I don't act like a Christian. And God showed me that the drinking for me was wrong. And that I turned into, I acted like a sinner when I was drinking. Yeah, can I assure you that even though I just did that with some humility, I didn't point them out. I focused on me. You may not agree with the way I do it, but I'm just telling you, I put all the focus on me. I ain't talking about your drinking. I ain't talking about how you act when you drink. I'm trying to tell you how I act when I drink. And when I drink, I don't act like no Christian. I don't act like a believer. As a matter of fact, if I start drinking two or three, I'm going to start doing some other stuff. I'm going to start putting some other stuff on the inside of my body that's going to really start jacking with my head. And then you're really going to see somebody like on a highway to hell. Because I'm going to start acting like the devil and I ain't going to look nothing like my Jesus. That's what the Lord's convinced me of. I'm not going to sit here and try to justify my actions because I know what a fool I act like. But just by me saying that little simple thing, hey man, I appreciate that, but I don't drink no more. But why don't you drink? Because uh, I'm a born again Christian now and when I drink, I don't act like a Christian. Just that little piece of information right there, it just slices. I'm telling you right now. It just sliced them and it brought conviction to their heart. And guess what? I didn't walk up in this mug talking about, are you alcoholic drinking no good or y'all all gonna split hell wide open? I didn't say nothing about that. Somebody offered me to go drink with them and I just, in my little space of the world, explained to them why I don't drink. But that was enough right there, I guarantee you, to cause frustration in their life. To cause conviction. And that they may not even understand it all. I have given them your word. And the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. You know. I mean, I was just thinking too. About a lot of different things. Do we have to have everything spelled out for us. On what is of the Lord. And what's of the world. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think, to some extent, I think that that's what people want, right? They want a scripture that says, this is sin, this is okay. Y'all you, you, know what I'm talking about? It wouldn't life be a lot easier? Come on, preacher, just give me a scripture, man. No, 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 no. Because there's a, there's a, there's a spirit behind the world, and there's a spirit behind the Lord. Yeah. See? And, there, and the spirit of the world is driving the masses in a particular direction. Can I guarantee you, or can you, hopefully you will at least believe me in this, that if you see the majority of the world doing a particular thing, that is probably not of the Lord. <laughs> because there's a spirit behind it. You know, one of the ways that I have learned the litmus test on what's godly and what's worldly is, are they getting addicted to it? Because listen, if they're getting addicted to it, then it's it's not the Holy Spirit that's behind it. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, well, I know a lot of people that are addicted to meth. Yeah, but I know people that get addicted to tattoos. Well, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say it's a different spirit behind it. I don't care whether they agree with me or not. I'm here to tell you, the Lord ain't told nobody to put a tattoo on their body. I got a tattoo on my body. You think I'm over here trying to judge you? But what I'm trying to say is if you think you're going to go evangelize, I'm the Lord's servant all tatted up with ink all over your body. Come on, man. No, that's not the spirit of the Lord. People got piercings all over their body. Well, that's how I'm reaching them. No, you look just like them. You look just like them, Mr. Harley Ryder or whoever you are, dude, that you're dressed just like them, inked up just like them, pierced just like them. And now you're riding in Daytona and you're all part of them and you think you look different than them? No, you look exactly like them. I'm either telling you the truth or I'm telling you a lie. And I'm, and I'm here to tell you that there's either a spirit behind it or there's not. People are like, oh yeah, but you see, that was Old Testament stuff. Do you realize that in the land of Canaan when the people were marking their bodies, the reason the Lord told them not to do that was because there was bloodshed involved with that? But I didn't get a tattoo on my neck, either did I. <laughs> I didn't, when I pierced my ear when I was 15 years old in military school, I didn't pierce my ear because I was worshiping the devil. Or at least not because I thought I was, even though I was saying I'm on a highway to hell. <laughs> I'm going to put my ear to the door. But that's lit isn't that weird? For you people that are Bible students, that's literally how I pierced my ear. Just like it says in the book of Numbers. Put your ear to the doorpost. I stuck the, the earring, dude. I just realized that. I stuck the earring on my ear and I pressed it up against the doorpost. Just like it says in the book of Numbers. When you become a bond slave of the Lord. But I wasn't trying to become no bond slave of the Lord. I was becoming a bond slave to him. You can do whatever you want with that. I realize you're not going to necessarily agree with me. What I'm trying to show you, though, is that the world is heading in a certain direction. And the Lord is saying, is standing over here and he's saying, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You will find rest for your weary souls because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God is different than the world. The world is trying to, the church is trying to take the stuff of the world and to bring it into the church. And now we're going to sanctify. Right. Even... I'm not trying to tell everybody you can't have your ears pierced, especially if you're a woman. I'm not even, dude, I, we're not United Pentecostal. That's not the point that I'm trying to make. I'm trying to make a point that if all these people, whenever you see somebody and they addicted to piercings, that should be an, an evidence that there's a problem because they can't get enough of it. Lord, there's a difference between the world and the church. There's a difference between the things of God. And I'm not even recommending that you go up to somebody that's full of piercings and tattoos and you'd be like, you know, you're not of the Lord. That's not, come on, man. How ridiculous is that? What are they going to think? They're going to think they're a total weirdo. They don't have a clue of what you're talking about. Can I just give you a, as a matter of fact, if you come to this church, please quit telling people you come to this church if you're going to talk down to sinners because of their sin because oh what are you saying preacher i need to condone their sin of course not but what did you think a sinner was going to do man <laughs> sinners sin right so until they get born again they're not going to know the difference between what they're doing now once a person is born again and the spirit of god lives on the inside of them they know when they sin and they know when they go in opposite direction to the Lord because the Holy Spirit is speaking to them the whole time. You're going in the wrong direction. Why don't you turn around? Many times we weren't turn around because we're so full of pride. Yeah. So full of pride and unwillingness to surrender ourselves to the ways of the Lord. Well, what are they going to think of me at the church? No, you don't worry about what they think about you at the church. You worry about what the Lord thinks about you. Amen? Amen. 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 Yeah. Praise God. I have given them your word and the world has hated it. I want you to see that, the word. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them. It's like in the same sentence. I have given them your word, semicolon, and the world has hated them. The word of God is a dividing line, my friend. The word of God is a dividing line between you and the world. The word of God is a dividing line between the, between the people of God and the people of the world. Because they are not... Of the world, even as I am out of the world, Jesus was out of the world. Yeah. 
Well, well, but Jesus, yeah, Jesus ate it and eat with sinners, my friend. The Lord never told you to isolate. He told you to separate. Yeah. Well, what, what does that even mean, Pastor? The Lord does not want you going to a crawfish boil and sitting down and drinking beer with them and talking the same language that they talk and looking like them and acting like them. If you can go to the same said crawfish boil and not drink and get drunk and act like a fool and talk like them and still talk like Jesus, because I guarantee you, Jesus wasn't getting drunk with drunkards. Amen. He was living different. He was telling them of a different hope, of a different plan. He wasn't getting all down in the slop. He was there to pull them out Hallelujah. to show them another way. Hallelujah. And if you can go to the pharmaceutical thing and not drink like them, then by all means go. And especially if you can throw a little something, something about Jesus up in there. Right? Amen. Amen. But don't be a fool. Right? Nobody's here to try to make rules for you, but don't be a fool. If you know that you going to that place is going to, next thing you know, you will have a beer in your hand. I stayed away from a lot of places for a long time because I knew the moment I stepped up in there, if they started pulling stuff out, I was in a bind because I was going to start doing what they did because I wasn't completely free from it. Don't put yourself in a bad predicament, Christian. This is what it means to hate, to detest. Especially to persecute. Look at this at the bottom. To pursue with hatred. There's something. I'm not trying to tell you that everybody that you know in the world hates you. Matter of fact, many times they probably love the fact that you take a stand for the Lord. Amen. But don't, don't be confused that at the same time the enemy is trying to put hate in their heart towards you. When you bring up things about God. Don't, don't be trusting the world. And listen, when you make yourself vulnerable and you talk to people about the things of God. And then you get some backlash later. You need to start recognizing the devil for his little games and his trickery. Just keep trusting God through all of that. The Lord's going to get you out of it. Amen. He'll take care of you. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. See, that's. Some people belong to the world. Some people belong to God. And look, the word is the dividing line. The word of God is the dividing line. And when you and I submit to the word of God and we get saved, you know what happens? The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. Let me ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hand. Are you saved this morning? Yeah. Are you saved this morning? Yeah. <laughs> well, how do I get saved, preacher? Well, you, first of all, you got to realize you're a sinner. Ooh, what are you trying to say? You got to realize that you're a sinner. Born of Adam, you're a sinner. And then you got to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And you got to be willing to believe that, Jesus, that God the Father raised him from the dead. And that he's what you need. And if you haven't believed that in your heart and confessed it with your mouth, then you're probably not saved. Amen? Amen? Now, just because you're saved don't mean that you get it right every day. Right? Right? But if you're saved, you know you're saved, like Sister Tim used to say, just that you know, that you know, that you know. Well, how do you know? Because when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, and you're not going to be the same, my friend. Amen. There's going to have to start being a dying to self. You can't just walk around here acting any old kind of way that you want to act. Knowing that the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you and that you're going to keep on living for the Lord like that. No. The, the Part of the message of the cross is that you and I died to self. Yeah. Amen? Amen? The Word of God, the Spirit of God is the separating line between what belongs to the world and what belongs to God. Do you belong to God this morning? Amen. That's why you and I need to come together as often as we can to learn the Word of the Lord together. That's why we need to have all... Off night Bible study for those that are willing to come or if you can't make it I understand try to make it as many times as you can if you can't make it on Wednesday nights try to watch stuff on on the video you know try to try to stay up with what we're talking about listen we understand we can't all make it but listen put the word of the Lord on the inside of you amen, amen. point number three God's truth is what makes the difference look at what the Lord said I pray not that you would take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 
You know, out of all the prayers, don't you sometimes wish, Lord, won't you just take me out of this place? How many times have you? Look, you know you really say when you start looking forward to the rapture of the church. <laughs> Amen. That's what I believe anyway, to some extent. Because guess what? This world becomes, it, it starts to just, it starts to look more dirty than it used to, right? Yeah. I mean, instead of seeing how life is saying it, you see the seaweed. <laughs> right. It's like, Lord, something's wrong with this place. I don't belong here. Yeah. I don't belong. This is not my home. Lord, won't you take me home when there's no more tears and there's no more crying and there's no more sorrow and there's no more heartache. But the Lord said, I'm not asking you, Father, to take them out of the world. Oh, that day's coming, my friend. Amen. Amen. That day's coming whenever the Lord will take us out of this world. He said, well, I'm not asking you to take them out. I'm just asking you to keep them from the evil one and that you would sanctify them through your truth. Your word is true. I want to talk to you a little bit about the concept of sanctification and truth. Look what, John, look what Jesus said earlier in John. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's the word of the Lord, amen? The more we understand the truth, the more we understand the truth that is Jesus working in our heart and changing our lives, the more freedom we will begin to experience in our life. As you have sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. The ESV version said, I consecrate myself that they also <coughs> might be sanctified through the truth. Now, if you're anything like me, and I know I've run over time, so I'm going to try to hustle up. Because I'm not trying to make you think too deep after I've already done all this talking. But if you're like me and you read this. <laughs> and you understand what sanctified means. Let me get a shout out. What does is, what is the word sanctification mean? Holy. It means holy. That's one meaning of it, right? What's another meaning? Set apart. set apart. Holy and set apart. That's what the word sanctification means. Now, are you sanctified? Yes, you are. But preacher, you don't know what I did last week. No, 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 no. You, you misunderstand. You're sanctified because you're in Christ. Yes. And as you keep walking with the Lord, your life starts looking more sanctified. Amen? But he says, so when I read this, I'm thinking to myself, but Lord, you should have already, I thought you was already sanctified, Lord. Like, you know, you, you, you were the one that had no sin. See, if you're anything like me, that's what you think. So, like, I wonder, let's take a look. So that's what the word sanctified means. It means holy and set apart. And he says, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. And so when I see that, I'm like, Lord, I thought you were already sanctified. But do you understand that Jesus was, what he was talking about was the cross. He was talking about the fact that he was about to undergo a change. Does that make sense? So if the word means holy and set apart, Jesus was already holy because he had no sin. But he was about to go through a transition in his humanity. He was about to become the first Human, the God man that ever died and resurrected from the dead. And because he was about to go to the cross and die and resurrect from the dead, it was going to afford you and I the opportunity to become one with him in his death and his burial and his resurrection from the dead. Let's take a look at this scripture right here, John chapter 16, verse 7. John 16. Verse 7. We'll go ahead and go to the King James right here. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you. Let's see what the other ESV said. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. See, that's what he's talking about. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. It is expedient for you that I go away. I go to sanctify myself, Father, that they might also be sanctified in your truth. Jesus said it is expedient. It's an advantage that I go and sanctify myself in, in the cross, in my death, in my burial, in my resurrection from the dead. Because he said this, for if I do not go away, then the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So by Jesus going through the final act 
of the Father's will for his purpose on life. He sanctifies, he sets himself apart from the human race. He sets himself apart and he allows himself to become the, the Holy One, amen, in the sense that he, he brings forth the final act that allows the Holy Spirit to come to be part of our lives so that we can now become part of the Father, part of the Son. We can be in him. He's in us. Amen. I want you to know that the good news is this, is that being sanctified and being holy and set apart, it's not your job to do that. Amen. Do you understand that? Amen. Now you, you got it. Well, I don't understand, preacher. He's telling me I can just do whatever I want to do. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that as you believe by faith that Jesus did what was necessary to change you, and as you keep looking to him as your source of strength, as you keep learning the word and allowing the spirit of God to have his way in your heart, he's changing you on the inside. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the comforter that's doing the work in you. And what you have to learn to do is to believe God and to trust God that what Jesus did was enough. And if you will keep believing that and trusting in the finished work of Jesus and what he did for you at the cross, the Holy Spirit will do the work on the inside of you. That's right. That's right. He will change you. He will change your mindset. He will change your heart. He will cause you to stop looking as much like the world and start looking more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word of God will begin to get on the inside of us and change us on the inside. Amen. Amen. Look at this. I'm going to close with these two verses right here. Singers, musicians, y'all can come. We're going to close out in a word of praise to the Lord. But this is just some practicality for you, for me, in our life. <laughs> Talking about being set apart. I like this scripture because I just, I use this scripture a lot through the years. But in Romans where it says, not to be conformed to this world. I know y'all still don't buy into everything I said. I just get this feeling that when I said something about tattoos and cars. I, <laughs> I hate it when he says that. <laughs> don't be conformed to the world. It means to be molded from an outside source. If the rest of the world is doing it, I'm just trying to say it's probably Amen. not over. Right. So. You got, you got, you don't listen. Hey, listen, whatever you do, don't take anything that I say. You take that before the Lord in prayer. Amen? Because you may not agree with me, and that's fine, because guess what? I'm a man. I'm just telling you what I feel like the Lord shows me. Be not conformed to this world. In other words, don't let the world mold you into its image. Oh, I think I just answered the question for you right there. Because if the rest of the world is saying, this is our image, and this is what we look like, and I start allowing myself to look like them, I ain't making myself look more like Jesus. No, I'm making myself look more like the world. Don't allow the world to mold you and make you to look like them. There's a whole lot of ways the world can mold you, my friend. Through their music, through their movies. It can mold your way of thinking. It can mold your mind. It can mold your heart. It can make you look more like them. Probably shouldn't say this, but me and Isabella got into an argument. We were driving back from somewhere. She's kind of, I feel like she's kind of sneaky about it. She probably get mad at me. If she knew I said it, but she said, oh, that's real Christian. <laughs> oh, look at the pastor. You're so Christian. She said, hey, she, and then so she starts. I said, you know, you just like the world, girl. You little worldly. So she's calling me a Christian and I'm calling her a worldly. Before, you know, when it was all said and done, we kind of just giggled at each other and I gave her a hug. But, but you know, that's just like, that's just like the, the world. Well, I'm just letting you know that the moment that they see you do something they don't like you to do, that's what they're going to do. Amen. Oh, look at you, Christian. Listen, I don't want to be conformed to this world. Amen. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind as the word of the Lord gets on the inside of me and begins to brainwash me. Wash my brain, Lord. Wash my brain. Yes. 
Let your word wash my brain. Let your spirit wash my brain. I don't want to think like the world. I don't want to look like the world. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Holy Spirit, I give you permission to have your way in my heart and in my life. Change my way of thinking. Look at this. This is the last scripture. Dearly beloved, this is Peter. I beseech you as a stranger and a pilgrim. You know, this earth is not your home, my friend. I, I hope you believe me. I hope you agree with me. Amen. This world is not your home. You're a pilgrim. You're just on a journey. Yes. Abstain from fleshly lust which war against your soul. Can I let you know something? It's not that every time you make a mistake, it means that you're going straight to hell. I used to go to a church that believed that. But let me tell you what, what the Word of God said right there. The Word of God said, the word of God said the fleshly lust more against your soul. The more you allow those things to come into your heart and in your life, the more it wars against your yeah. soul. The more it wars against the things of God in your life. We're going to close out this morning in a song of praise unto our Lord. Amen. You're dismissed this morning as always. If you do need prayer for some, the altars are open. I pray that you bring Jesus with you this week at work with your friends wherever you go. Amen.